Well, everyone, the initial numbers are in for Ubisoft Quartz, and it's really funny. Of course, we're all going in for the NFTs to make some money. Of course, to, for Ubisoft, be on top of a platform at which they, you know, get a little slice of the change as every transaction happens. And what is really quite funny is that for their whole big plan and all the hype they try to put into it, it hasn't really been doing that well. Because, of course, whenever a big company sells some DLC, maybe sells a store mount and an MMO, we barely have any idea how many people have actually bought it. I mean, there's ways to find out, but generally speaking, you just don't know how many people have bought the skin. Well, what's fun with all of this just being, you know, open blockchain is we can actually find out how things are going. So let's take a look. Obviously, the Ubisoft Quartz announcement was met with pretty much nothing but negative uh, sentiment. I'm sure that perhaps the, the Bored Ape people were very excited about it, but just about nobody else really seemed to be. Essentially, the core criticism is NFTs are not a core piece of technology to deliver any of the functionality that basically, from a player-facing like gameplay perspective, uh, th that come with this. It's pretty much just so that you own the NFT, which is linked to a digital asset, that you'll be able to sell on later. Now, of course, with people being quite negative about this, it was no surprise that Ubisoft employees were voicing worries about uh, quite a lot, including, say, the environmental impact. Obviously, that's the environmental impact of, of NFTs, depending on what they're running on. Um, of course, with Quartz, not... Honestly, not an issue. Your transaction costs about 30 seconds of streaming video. It's a proof of stake chain, so it's pretty different stuff. I think the environmental issue now we can be a bit more, you know, a bit more settled about. Um, but other employees were concerned um, about potentially received orders from Ubisoft management to basically shoehorn NFTs into their game. So imagine you're the game director of a, a game at Ubisoft, and now you're thinking, shit, I'm doing the next Assassin's Creed thing and they're probably going to want me to design an NFT system for it. Ubisoft said that this was an experiment, but it's been pretty clear that they're feeling quite all in. They've talked about wanting to be a major player in this, uh, in this uh, space. Now, what's fun, and this is, I guess, where the news broke, uh, Liz Edwards, who works on Apex Legends, uh, did some rummaging around to see what was going on. So, uh, I looked at two third-party marketplaces that the Quartz site links to, and there seems to be 15 sales in total. Zero the last day on one site. Am I reading this right? And you go through, the total volume comes out to 396 uh, USD uh, for that one. Uh, then, of course, Ubisoft will actually have had to have paid, or cost is incurred in minting, so... There's, you know, there's that as well. It's not that much, really, but, you know, for doing a lot of coins, it, it would add up. So, by those figures, they've sold about 15. 15 Ghost Recon Breakpoint NFTs since the launch, which is about 400 bucks. Um, though, m the cost of minting all of those could have been 730 bucks. Now, Stephen Totillo, who's a journalist for the publication Axios, uh, jumped in and uh, took another look at things. So he's saying that, for starters, as Liz mentioned, Ubisoft authorized two third-party marketplaces to support the sale of their NFTs, uh, which were initially given out for free to Ghost Recon PC players, some of which were tied to playtime criteria. I believe it was playing, well, at least for one of them, over 600 hours. So on one market, the total sales is the 398. On the other market, 795. So... Very few of these Ubisoft NFTs, which are known as Quartz Digits, very few have sold. Uh, the marketplace Rarible lists nine sales since the 15th and none six since the 16th. And four of those sales were in fact the same account. All nine sales in Rarible are for the gun skin, the first of the NFTs offered by Ubisoft. Not one has bought the pants, which are the 100 hours of game time required to obtain one and nobody's bought the helmet, which is 600 hours. And across both stores, nobody's even selling the helmets. That does kind of make me wonder if the people who are getting the helmets are just seeing it as a, a badge of having played for 600 hours, so they want to hold on to it. And maybe that's part of the plan. There could be a degree of some scarcity there, but I'd also say it's Ghost Recon Breakpoint. I mean, maybe Ubisoft numbers have you know, something that, that obviously that I don't, 
but it doesn't seem to me like the game that's going to have the most hype around this. Unless I'm mistaken and they have somehow turned it around, but I hadn't really heard of that. So there's not a lot of sales in Rarible, but there have been plenty of transfers, which don't require an actual sale, as best as he can tell. So that's 86 transfers in total. 49 of them involve transfers to the same account. 24 involve transfers from that same account. In some, one account is transferring a gun skin NFT to another, which transfers a different gun skin back to them. Now, of course, the different there is not a visual difference. As we covered, it's the different serial numbers because apparently Ubisoft really does think that it's the different serial numbers and the basically traceability of ownership via that serial number that uh, makes it a cool, unique thing. Uh, now, that account that's involved in more than 70 of the 80 plus transfers on Rarible, well, they seem to be trying to hoard the Ubisoft NFTs. While Ubisoft offers only one of each NFT to its users, that account, because of all the transfers, has 25 of them. Steven says, make of that what you will, but to me it's a sign of somebody trying to corner the market. Yeah, it's just like that time, you know, I saw all the netherweave cloth on my server in World of Warcraft, so I bought it all to try to price gouge the market. Suffice to say, it didn't really work, and, well, <laughs> netherweave cloth is a not really not really having the scarcity that the NFTs do, in fairness to the NFTs. Um, but this is somebody trying to stake their claim early, obviously hoping that some of this stuff catches on. Because if these things are basically not really going for any amount of money, but in a year or two, they're worth maybe 50, 60, 70, 80 bucks each. I mean, think about CSGO knives, and you're able to hoard them all up now, you're going to get a pretty damn nice ROI. I think that's what somebody would be thinking in this case. And certainly if I was in that position and I was super engaged with it, yeah, I suppose I could see me thinking the same thing. I mean, this could be somebody just trying to make a quick buck. They don't even need to believe in NFTs as a technology or anything like that. So basically, while this is all obviously early days and things could absolutely change, perhaps especially if this was applied to a game that people were a decent bit more excited about or a game that was a bit more in the limelight, it's not a particularly great start. I can understand Ubisoft wanting to start with a quick little test on something like Breakpoint, but you can obviously see the bad PR. Now, of course, for Ubisoft, they can see this fail, pretty much just blame that it was Breakpoint, say, ah, well, you know, we proved the technology, we'll apply it somewhere else to success. Now, what's interesting is uh, there are some worries here, right? So, um, well, this is from Kotaku. Inside the Ubisoft Paris studio, which makes Breakpoint, some developers are worried about a game they spent years rehabilitating after a disastrous 2019 launch, having its reputation dragged through the mud just so the company can stake its claim on the latest speculative tech fad. Indeed, according to a recent Ubisoft community report reviewed by Kotaku, the announcement of Quartz led to an unprecedented negative swing in player sentiment about the live service open world shooter. So this is something that doesn't seem to be going down that well with the actual player base of that game. And that's a sad thing. Because if anyone deserves to have their game go right, it's people who stuck by that one, who really enjoyed Ghost Recon Wildlands, saw Ubisoft basically gouge out the thing that they loved, I would say, so that they could make more money off it via microtransactions and things. They finally have these developers trying to, you know, make maybe the game they actually wanted. Now this happens. I mean, that's such a bummer. That's going to make somebody not want to touch Ubisoft again. You could say that's short-sighted. I suppose you could also say that if loads of people are going to jump into NFTs, maybe from a business case, and I'm sure the bigwigs think this, it'd be short-sighted not to do NFTs, and it would be silly to incur that risk in a game that's more important to their overall portfolio. So basically, to me, it feels like we're almost counting down the days until this appears in Rainbow Six Siege. I think the play dynamics of Siege will lend themselves quite a bit better to a thing like Quartz. And, you know, do remember here, Ubisoft's FAQ says it gets a percentage cut of the sale value in some cases. So you know why they want to do this. They basically want to be Valve sitting atop a massive marketplace of in-game items. And they want to be able to drive more sales and higher prices for those sales by the scarcity component. That is Ubisoft's plan. Now, I think from the perspective of gamers who don't really like any of this stuff generally and are frustrated at a lot of these monetization things, we can obviously see how that's... It's obviously something for Ubisoft's goals. Now, if you're coming in here as a business person, I think you're going to understand how 
sitting atop a marketplace, just getting your little cut, I think you can see how that's a pretty damn lucrative place to be. And I think we can understand why a company would push through bad PR to get there if they could. I think Valve were just lucky enough and they even had a lot of drama, obviously, a lot of negative press. But if they tried that shit today, they'd be absolutely hammered, but they were able to just sneak it in before it had really exploded as a topic. And who would not want to be in Valve's position, presiding over marketplaces, getting a very lucrative cut? Now, as we continue, uh, Eves is really not that worried, basically. Um, so Ubisoft employees not particularly happy about this. Ubisoft employees generally don't seem to really have a great deal to be happy about these days, considering a lot of the concerns internally about the company. Well, in a Q&A call, um, their CEO, Eves, basically just said that, no, courts is going to be awesome. We're doing it. Uh, now, he didn't give staff any concrete reasons as to why they should be excited about this, because I think for everybody obviously knows it's just a part of the business, not really part of the core creative side. Um, but yeah, the bulk of the session focused on pointless buzz buzzwords like metaverse and web three, <laughs> and didn't really offer much in the way of real real uh, details to actually you know allay staff's fears. And according to sources that they spoke to, this meeting was not scheduled at the beginning of the week, right? So basically, it's a response to courts. The staff are telling Kotaku that he didn't hold a Q&A last year when the rights, uh, widespread uh, allegations of sexual misconduct happened. But, you know, now when it's courts and it's impacting the business side of things, oh, we do get the Q&A. Now, as for what Eve's actually said, well, the public backlash was expected. Yeah, totally. He likened it to public outcry over DLC microtransactions and loot boxes. See, that's an interesting thing. I was there at the very start of DLC being a thing, right? I was there on Xbox Live, you know, and at the same time, I was very used to the traditional big box PC game expansion set. And initially for me with DLC, I was excited. It was the idea that, oh, I could get like a little bit more story for Oblivion and it doesn't have to be the full size of it. I was excited about that. Now, I think many of us were in that position. And then as we basically grew up, in my case, went through adolescence, we saw what business interests would do as they would hyper-optimize away from the high consumer value traditional expansion set and towards the nickel and diming of a lot, not all, but a lot of modern DLC practices. And that's the thing with Eves. DLC microtransactions. Now, loot boxes, I think there are inherent moral issues with. DLC and microtransactions, there's nothing wrong with them. It's how they're used. They're just tools. And in this case, I do not think they are used to deliver maximum consumer value. And that's why people don't like them. Now, I think with NFTs, you can see a little bit of the consumer value, the idea that you could resell your thing. But again, the NFT isn't exactly needed for that. And given the overall context here, and I think the amount of VC money that is flowing into Web3 these days, people are just generally suspicious. I mean, even to look at Jack Dorsey and his recent big tweet storm about Web3 basically just being owned by the VCs now. And that's bearing in mind that Jack Dorsey is CEO of Square. I think they may have renamed themselves, but you know, Square, um, right? Which is heavily in the crypto space. And even he's coming around blasting Web3, or at least blasting the big money VC interests getting involved. And I think that's something a lot of people are feeling you know? And of course, we have all the metaverse talk, which is pretty obvious given the, uh, well, the market cap of Roblox right now, which is absolutely massive. Of course, that's something that, uh, you know, even Roblox itself has got a few, a few little quandaries. People Make Games actually did a pretty interesting uh, deep dive into Roblox and um, just the idea of, are they basically enlisting a, well, it's the usual thing, be the corporation at the top of the platform, in their case, solicit labor from loads and loads of kids to make all the custom game modes just take your little you know cut off the top so there's a lot going on as a lot of gaming and these technologies move forward and i think it's just that you know so many of us like we're just like oh all this shit come on C come on we know about second life we know about all of the real money pseudo scam mmos that exist come on right that's the thing that's the thing with us people who play games i think we've seen so much shit directly be injected into the things that we like that we're just hyper fucking aware of this because you watch a movie or tv i mean sure there could be some product placement sure if it's traditional there could be some advertisements but generally you're getting the thing you asked for 
Gamers, though, we're used to the thing that we like being sliced and diced. And I think that's just meant that we're really, really on the ball. Our bullshit meter is so well calibrated, and that is one of the things that I like about us. Frankly, it's hard to pull a fast one on gamers. That's pretty good. Now, of course, all of this stuff with these companies is leading to a lot of really pissed off people. It's a broader part of what they're calling the Great Resignation. Now, some of this is that venture capital money is flying around all over the place, so it's pretty viable if you're an industry vet to actually make a big, daring new studio, you know, with that VC money. But a lot of people are also just leaving to other industries, things like that. And I think a situation like this with Ubisoft is a major problem because they are having difficulties keeping employees. This is something we've even heard for Ubisoft Toronto, and I thought it was rather telling that the Splinter Cell announcement was kind of focused on being like, hey there, potential workers, would you like to work on uh, on Splinter Cell? It's almost like saying, hey, please, we really need staff. And then, of course, we have um, VGC. I forget which one of them. Uh, chiming in and saying, <laughs> yeah, I've heard bad things about Ubi Toronto. So this is something that is a, a tremendous threat to the games industry. The sheer amount of talent that we're losing is uh, deeply worrying. Deeply worrying. And I feel like that loss of talent could be made up for in terms of sheer body count. And I think that's pretty damn bad for the creative state of video games. So apparently as a part of this, Ubisoft is being hit particularly badly as staff fall off is leading to stalled or slowed projects. Um, now Axios, citing figures from LinkedIn, are claiming that Ubisoft's annual attrition rate is about 12% within a 20,000 person workforce. Epic Games, 7% attrition rate. Take Two, 8%. EA, 9%. Want to know what Acti Blizzes is? 16%. Now, if you want one of the best metrics for what it's actually like inside a company, it's that fucking attrition rate. That is what you want to look at. Because regardless of the news stories and all of that, this is what staff are actually doing when the actual situation of their own life is on the line. Because where you work is pretty damn important to what you do. Even though Epic have had all that talk of crunch, I mean, they, maybe they pay well. Who knows? But it's pretty damn low for Epic. Same for Take-Two. Same for EA. You have to double Take-Two's attrition rate to hit Blizzard. <laughs> that's, that's wild. You almost have to double Epic's to, uh, to hit Ubisoft. So I think it is fascinating that, you know, Activision Blizzard is leading the pack here in terms of attrition. I think that is that is just one of the worst health signs for a company, in my view. And uh, seeing Ubisoft be like this, pretty rough. And we look at Activision Blizzard, what do you see? Especially in the Blizzard side. You see delayed projects. You see, where is the content? All this bullshit about, oh, patch 9.2 of Shadowlands is the, is the final bit we planned. To which every WoW player who's played a WoW expansion says, ah, interesting. So are you telling me in your announcement video that you literally plan to give me much, much, much less content for the same subscription fee? All right, cool. We know bullshit when we see it. I think it's pretty damn obvious that the staff attrition is, it's a sort of thing, as gamers, we just see dates be pushed back. I think a lot of this is the why. Now, from Axios here, top name, name talent is leaving, with at least five of the top 25 credited people from the company's biggest 2021 game, Far Cry 6, already gone. Twelve of the top 50 from last year's biggest release, Valhalla, have left as well. Thirteenth recently returned. Mid-level and lower staff are also out the door. One developer recently said a colleague currently at Ubisoft contacted them to solve an issue with the game because no one was there who still knew the system. And that's the thing. Whenever, and especially when you're using a custom engine, like, say, Snowdrop in uh, some of the Ubisoft studios, it's not like you can just grab an Unreal dev, throw them in, and know exactly what to do. I mean, in fairness, if a company's working on Unreal, they'll have a whole bunch of their own custom tools and systems built, you know, within that framework. Um, but certainly, you're, you're losing a lot of talent, and pretty specific talent that knows how you do things. That is a massive loss. As for why this is happening, well... We've got low pay, apparently being one. We've got frustration at creative direction. I think that's something that a lot of people who play Ubisoft games, or at least played them, also would agree with. An abundance of more competitive opportunities elsewhere. Um, they Basically, because of all of these issues, they're a target for headhunters and recruiters. I think the same probably for Blizz. Um, Ubisoft did actually recently boost pay at their Canadian studios. Um, it wasn't exactly the most equal feeling thing, though, so there was still some frustration over that. There's also unease at the collective management, how they've basically handled the sexual misconduct allegations. 
You know, here's a quote. It's legitimately embarrassing. Easy target for recruiters. There's something about management and creative uh, scraping by the bare minimum that really turned me away. Many spoke fondly of their time at the company, and one said they'd even consider returning, but the past year and a half was a breaking point. Now, apparently they're not worried because they have hired 2,600 people since April. It's a lot of people per month, isn't it? Uh, that's down from 4,500 in the same reporting period across uh, the two years prior. Oh, from Axios. Our attrition rate today is a few percentage points above where it currently is. Ubisoft's head of people ops told Axios in an interview. But it's still within industry norms. You can always look to Activision Blizzard and think, ah, well, at least they're worse. And of course, moving from 8% to 12%, those are similar numbers. 12% is 50% more than 8%. <laughs> right? It's pretty big. Anyway, a spokesperson noted that questions in a recent company-wide survey about whether employees are happy at the company um, and would recommend Ubisoft as a great place, uh, place to work uh, returned a score of 74, which they said was in line with the industry average. I mean, we could just take that and be like, okay, that's what your survey turned up. But why is your attrition rate higher than normal and a lot higher than other companies in, in the same industry? important and it's the sort of thing me and you we only feel the second order effects but we feel them we do feel them where's the games why do the games feel cut down etc etc even why are there loads of bugs if your engineering team is a revolving door and the new people have got to get up to speed with the engine with the custom tool set obviously there's going to be more bugs obviously there's going to be less time to act in qa because QA are actually really good at finding shit. Usually, there's just a bottleneck and actually fixing shit. So that's what's going on, everyone. Between the, <laughs> the NFTs and these turnover rates. <sighs> Pretty damn rough. And I'll tell you what, I'd love to see that same analysis for other industries to see where basically gaming is compared to them. But that's it for today. I hope you found this interesting. I thought it was bloody fascinating. And I'll see you next time.